highest in the lower 48. The Alaskans talk of this as the lower 48, with a little contempt. <laughs> Have you been to Alaska? Yeah, twice. Ah, in fact, John told me of a film of you flying an airplane. Was that around Mount McKinley? Yes. Ah, is there some way we could get a copy of that? Well, I imagine so, yeah. You? It's on, it's on the eight millimeter. What I wanted to do is put a piece of that shot next to you getting into the, the helicopter yesterday. Oh. <laughs> that be fun? Oh, I see. Yeah, uh, yeah that, uh, that is extremely rugged country. It almost flattens this out. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been to the Himalayas? No. No. But the Puranas uh, speak of a Himalaya that's north of the North Pole. Well, how is that? No one knows that. No, well, you, of course, we, north of the North Pole to us doesn't mean anything. But from their point of view, go up to the North Pole okay. in a straight line and go beyond. Would it be Mount McKinley? You'll get Mount McKinley. That's right. Now, uh, the word Himalaya means snowy range. Sierra Nevada mean snowy range. So here we are. Now. So these are the Himalayas of the west. That's right. <laughs> and they are the Sierra Nevada of the east. It's all the same somewhere. What can we, what are those mountains you see up there? What is that? Yeah, what are those mountains that we see right outside the window? Well, you don't, these are the Sierra Nevada. You don't see any of the named peaks right here. Oh. They're beyond the range? Yes, they're further back. We're too near to see them. I have um, some more questions, too, relative to the Alabamas. Remember I asked you and you said because the people came from Alabama? Yeah, there were some here at that That's time. why they named the rocks Alabama? Yes, it is not really related to the country. It has nothing to do. Well, how did those rocks, those are glacial rocks. How did they what? what are, why are those rocks so different from everywhere else? Well, these are very ancient, according to the geologists, uh -huh. even pre-Cambrian. Oh, yes. The, uh, if you'll notice, the crystals are breaking down. The rocks are really dead. This is a very young range. Interesting that they should mix this way. Yeah, yeah. And they do look old, too. Oh, they are very old. Now, pre-Cambrian would imply when they... In earlier days, they thought the Cambrian uh, was the beginning of life, but they have found microscopic life still older. Mm -hmm. But pre-Cambrian means very old. That's up in the billions. So there, that indicates then this land, there's not fossil, uh, sea fossils in that grouping. I don't know of any here. No. So but there, then the, one would assume that that was uh, exposed for a long time. Oh, yes. That would be, but then uh, there you'd have to look up the uh, geological authorities. And while you've been here, we have been sleeping down at Tuttle Creek Campground, and the stars, the sky is incredibly deep. I know. And so you have been under this sky all this time, and I find myself, my dreams are affected here, and my whole... My imagination is much more expansive. I mean, the horizon is huge. And you've been here for all this time. Oh, yes. Exposed. Yes. We started building this house in 1961, completed in 63. Gertrude and I built it almost wholly. We had one professional here for a while. Um, also one of our associates. You were 70 when you started building? 63, uh, no. 61 and 13 is 74. Yes, excuse me. <laughs> yes. Because people have been giving me questions to ask you. And then we'll just sort of freely jabber on about different things that are going on. Um, there is uh, specific questions relative to how the ashram was located in that spot. Someone has mentioned that you said it was in the, uh, uh, the corner of a triangle which stretches from here to some 
someplace very distant from here. Do you do you have any? Well, I I don't know just what they had in mind. Well, no, that may be just a rumor. Yes. Kind of thing. Um, the location in general is close to the highest point in what was then the United States. Uh, and right now, of course, Mount McKinley has that honor. <laughs> And you flew around Mount McKinley? That is right. When was that? Uh, 1965. We have um, questions also relative to yesterday's uh, talk, which was a marvelous talk. Uh, one was uh, propydutic. You said that word numbers of times, and uh, that was, everybody would look at each other at the <laughs> What it means uh, preliminary to. Preliminary to. Yes. In, that, in, the, in the sense that epistemology and logic are propydutic to uh, substantive philosophy. Okay. And we have uh, something from the book which everybody wanted to have clarified, and that is the statement that substantiality is inversely proportional to ponderability. Which oh. seems self-evident to me. However, I think it would be a good uh, you... I have an, at least an hour's tape on that. Oh, you do? And there's a mandala that's based on that. It's hanging in the wall, on the wall in there. You might be interested in we could photograph photographing that. Uh-huh. And maybe you could tell me exactly the tape, and we'll, we'll pull it out of the... Um... But we'd, I have to have John make a hunt for it. Then I'll make that in my notation. Would you like to give us a, just a little... About it? Yeah. All right. And I'll put that in my notation. I can give you the history of it. I was, at the time, it was about 1935, uh, during the Deep Depression, we were up in Placer County, California, um, exploring something of the residue gold that might have been left by the Argonauts. I got a little, but not enough. <laughs> I was down on Tuttle Creek, a tributary of the North Fork of the North Fork of the American River. <laughs> and I was looking at the mountains around me in the sky above, and suddenly it dawned upon me that there where we see objects, there is a relative void, and that the seemingly empty space is substantive. Instead of there being reality, where the objects appear, there is relative void. There where no, but there where nothing seems to appear is the reality which is substantive. Is that relative to the time, of the light, the speed of light is relative? No, I, no I didn't go into m m physical conceptions. Okay. Now, that can be stated mathematically in the form. The S representing substantiality equals 1 over P, which is the way of saying mathematically in inversely proportional. Now you can, with algebraic processes, multiplying through by P, you can get the equation PS equals 1. Mm -hmm. Now, in the usual form, you use X and Y. But, but that happens to be the equation of the equilateral hyperbola referred to its asymptotes as axes of reference. <laughs> Convenient. Usu usually, your coordinates are 
run so they bisect the hyperbola. Um, and uh, you can change the form like to, uh, I think it's p square, square minus s square equals two. At any rate, you add to that the conjugate hyperbola and you get my mandala out there. Which one is that? It's on the wall on the east side. Can somebody get that? You could bring it in here yeah. if you want a photograph. That would be good. That'd be perfect for this. Is there, is there a door open? You want to open? Yeah. Ah, here it is. The coloring is not relevant. That was somebody else's idea. But this is... This is the design is in the, the pathways. Yes. No. I mean, in the um, consciousness without an object. Right. Is that sufficient? Is that, is that good? <laughs> now, in traditional mysticism, you have the conception of the squaring of the circle or of the circularization of the square. The principle of squaring the circle is rendering manifest or articulate that which is unmanifest or inarticulate. Um, the mystical use of the squaring of a circle um, is not the same as the mathematical question. Well, the t two were related in the time of the Greeks. And the relationship between the circle and the square um, is represented by a very important transcendental number known as pi, which is three point and a decibel, decimal that is non-terminating and non-repeating, a transcendental number which has some very remarkable properties. Thus, that number appears in a, any formula involving the principle of probability. A very interesting thing and rather mysterious. Piazzi Smythe, who wrote Our Inheritance of the Great Pyramid, which apparently is pre-Egyptian, according to the secret doctrine Atlantean, and actually constructed according to the secret doctrine three sidereal cycles ago, plus a certain number of years, 78,000 plus. He pretty well demonstrated that it was a monument to the number pi. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. That's a, a grand monument, and it's a yeah. grand concept. Yeah. I gave a series of lectures on that one time I worked them out. Are they recorded? No, that was before the recording. How will people have access to some of these? I know you have them on big reel-to-reel. -reel. Will someone put them into cassettes that will be published? If someone will, I, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> okay, so they're essentially they're available to them. They're available. Now. Yes. Um, there is one that has recently been brought to my attention, uh, of which I have a written transcript. Um, now, we haven't quite finished with that mandala. I've only started okay. in. Okay. Now, uh, you keep your your, uh, the idea 
of the circularizing of the square, the inversion of this process. Squaring of the circle would be a movement from the unmanifest to the manifest. The return process might be called a circularizing of the square. Now a circle is the locus of a point that is a, a, at a uniform distance from a given point. So what is emphasized in the circle, that which is attracted to your attention, is the center. The center symbolizing, therefore, the self. That which I am, the Atman, in the language of Vedanta and of Buddhism. Now, if you are familiar with uh, Buddhistic and Vedantistic philosophy, you know the orientation of the Vedanta, Vedanta in the form as given by Sri Shankar Acharya is an orientation to the Atman or the Self. Buddhism, in contrast, is an Atmic. And how are, and which is equivalent to saying that there is no permanent Self. Now you have two possible orientations orientation to the center or the orientation to space. Now in the case of the hyperbola, the curve spreads out and is theoretically closed at infinity. It is orientation to space. The so-called center of the hyperbola is external to the curve, as you'll see here. You see the curve, the concave side is this way. In the case of the circle, you see it's central to the curve, but the center is external to the hyperbola. Would you, would you point that out again? Yes, the center of the circle here is inside this cir circle, but external to the hyperbolic curve, which runs this way, you see. It's on the convex side. So, that your orient emphasized orientation in the case of the hyperbola is to space. And so you could tie that in with the anatmic doctrine of the Buddhists. I have both principles, the orientation to the center and the orientation to space represented in that mandala. And it grows out of that formula. Substantiality is inversely proportional to ponderability. <laughs> now you ask questions about something that's a bit technical. <laughs> that's what we want. We want a combination. We want both the uh, extreme uh, pre precision which you can give us in only your way and also to sort of gossip. We want both of the, <laughs> the hemispheres represented here. I noticed, in fact, yesterday and the day before that you use many techniques which people are just discovering now uh, with the use of uh, hypnotic inductions, etc., where people are brought to certain emotional levels and then and enticed in various uh, intellectual levels and then brought into an emotional level and then an intellectual level. I experienced that myself and I... Yes. Seem to really well, I'm strongly opposed to the use of any hypnotic matter or any psychedelic or, or um, uh, narcotic drug. The process, it's very essential that the process shall be conscious and under normal conscious control. 
it seems that you have a very um, developed ability, though, to relate to an audience with extremely deep material. Uh, people who don't have the background that you have, and you get across things which they have never had any uh, development in. And while you brought in many different scholars, you brought them uh, their information to the group, uh, I noticed, as you said, you were stepping on the pet corns of the psychologists, etc. You did. You had a separate situation going on where you you drew conflicts out, and then brought over the four hours brought everything together into a beautiful whole. And I feel that that is a technique used in order to accomplish a full. Um, Spectrum. A, a rounded picture, yes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, and when you did that, it brought people through the same steps, an induction stepping stone, you might say. Well, yes, uh, I would say that the a person who is not intellectually prepared to follow the reasoning do get an effect through what we might call induction. Induction I'm taking over from um, electricity. You know that uh, by the appropriate action, you can pick up a current of electricity from a root current in a wire, which has no physical connection with that wire. And that is something we call an induced current. So it seemed to me an appropriate figure where you're dealing with a certain form of consciousness and manifested in one given individual which tends to arouse something corresponding to it in the consciousness of the hearer. Um, the Tibetans use the word placing face to face for it, a different kind of symbolism. But glimpses are brief experiences of the consciousness that comes from realization can be induced. It's shown, uh, they've done a lot of tests with uh, animals, whereby one, say a group of chimpanzees, one in that group will learn something which will be far advanced to the rest of the members in the group. And it, it took a period of discovery for that particular animal to come to that discovery. And then shortly thereafter, the whole group, even though they didn't have direct association with the building mm -hmm. up to that, have acquired that... It's a kind of contagion, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Induction is... A, you could use the word contagion, mm -hmm. too. I think the induction fits our modern technology, fits our day, facing face to face, fit another day which was non-technological. Mm -hmm. So more examples and more presences of people who have developed the, um, that particular root source of energy or, or ability um, or development will the more there are, the more there will be. It just sort of snowballs. It, uh, it is favorable to the awakening to have had such experience. So I'm working toward that which is variously called awakening, realization, or enlightenment, to render it as available as possible within my range of influence. Others are doing the same thing. Now, you've been here in this situation, in this site, for a long time, making yourself available to everyone that comes here. And have you considered that your work, or you just, this is where you are and people just arrived? Or you can Well, I have regular meetings on Sunday, and everyone is welcome to it. Uh, but individuals do arrive, sometimes from an astonishingly long distance away. Some 20 odd have arrived from the Atlantic seaboard as a result of pathways. A very curious thing, more people come from the coast than from the heartland of the country. And I've been wondering about that. I think there's something quite earthy 
about the heartland. It's food, it's the food raising area. It's the breadbasket for the whole country and for a good portion of the world, in point of fact. But there seems to be an earthiness in the consciousness of the people there. And that on the coast, there seems to be uh, something more than that. Striving out to something else, yes. unknown. I think the, the uh, ocean has that effect. Also, I think coastal people are travelers. You, and, and maybe travelers inwardly as well. At any rate, uh, it, it was an interesting observation. It means something. I'm not entirely sure just what it means. But we found that to be a fact. Would you consider yourself a coastal person for your whole life? I've always, my residence has always been California from birth. I've been away from the state, of course, in lecturing, and also during the First World War when I was a draftee. But this has always been home. No, no residence established in any other state. Have you ever um, been in a position to advise a person in political power of any sort? No. No. Um, would you? We were talking about that yesterday, what would be the thing to promote the world welfare. And you had several suggestions. If you could um, sort of expand upon the idea of the cooperating uh, entities on this planet. Well, world government. I think man's unlocking of the power represented by the atom bomb virtually forces world government, whether we like it or not. At the present time, we're moving on the basis of the balance of terror. And I don't see any real security in that. The probability is very high that somewhere, somehow, and as a bomb may be set off, and atomic war precipitated, and the result, a holocaust. I think that danger is very real, and that so long as nations stand in a relationship of a sort of armed truce, we're not secure. We're not, a, we're not secure in living with an atom bomb. In a bow and arrow age, it isn't serious. But in an atomic age, it is serious. One might feel that man discovered power of that sort when he was not yet ready for it on the moral level. One could wish that it hadn't happened. But it has happened. There's no going back into the womb of the earlier day. We'll have to deal with it. Well, you, you said, or you have said, that you think that the this plane is sort of the hellish. Yes, I discovered that in 1936. There was no danger of going to hell because we were there already. So you say <laughs> that that's then the, the perpetual state of fear and war. And that's yeah, that is. That is the hellishness of this life. Look at the fact that only evil makes news. Listen. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a little of good, heroism and so forth comes in, but the predominant tone of news is that which you would call the dark side of our life. Then read history, you find the same thing again. The thing that stands out is the wars between peoples. Now, that's a hellish choice of interest. Yes. Then, is it possible, then, that this will always be, if on this plane, this is the state of this plane? Well, we hope that light can come in. There has been a long, drawn-out effort 
to redeem this level of consciousness. We don't despair of success. It's not then that there are levels that every one in every evolutionary situation must go through and this is just one level? Right. And therefore, the, as soon as it becomes uh, resolved, you are in fact in another level. Yes, you'll be on so another level. The, the hellish level will maintain itself for the... Well, we hope ultimately success in transformation of that. We don't despair. We don't despair. Okay. You were saying that you were very glad that you didn't think you had to stay around for right. the mess of it. Well, do you feel responsible for some of the mess? After all, you've been here longer than I have. I may be. I may have added my degree of responsibility for mistakes. <laughs> and so, essentially, um, your contribution is also that you have added some of, of the, um, sort of a, a drop of water into the pool of necessary resolve as well. I hope I've added something. I've tried to. You coined the expression interception. Would you say that there are other specific words or, or pieces of philosophical uh, transmissions that were only yours or only your words? Well, of course, that is a, a form of cognition. The, uh, we are all familiar with perception through the senses, including the animals. In addition, we have a conceptual form of cognition on which I spoke especially on the four tapes of this convention. Um, and those two forms are well recognized in the history of philosophy and in psychology. But in that state which is called fundamental realization or enlightenment, you find these discussed in our Bendor gradient, the, there is another principle of cognition involved. It's non-sensuous and non-conceptual. And the dominating principle is knowledge through identity, a state in which the cognizer and the cognized are fused. The consciousness is neither sensual nor conceptual. Therefore, I faced the problem of developing a term for it. It didn't exist, so I coined the word introceptual, which uh, employs the Latin forms, really. So it's a correct determination of a word. It's, it's not a barbarism, not a combination of two languages. It's Latin. And its definition runs through my work over several hundred pages, ultimately. And that's now available, as we know. Mm -hmm. this, this particular piece of information has just become available in your latest book. Mm -hmm. It is discussed by Dr. Melvin in his introduction to the last volume published there. You may have some trouble following it because it is an effort to explain to the popular mind transfinite numbers. If you've tried reading it, you may have had a little fun. We've been reading from it, little passages from <laughs> it, since we got it the other day, Friday. Um, have you an experience with G. Spencer Brown, Laws of Form, the author of Laws of Form? I have the book. I've not really made a study of it yet, but I, I'm interested in his work, all right. And um, he certainly got a high recommendation from Bertrand Russell, who is well known in the field of the logic of mathematics. Yes, it's interesting. The um, beginning premise of G. Spencer Brown is the, um, the unmarked state and then the first mark. Well, it is the first, the first thing that happens 
indeterminate consciousness is a distinction. Uh, you might say that the primitive state of a newly born child would be a state of no distinction. Uh, perhaps uh, well described by William James when he said it, a state of blooming, buzzing confusion. There are no trees in it, no rocks, no animals, no houses, no valleys and mountains, no stars, no lakes, just a blooming, buzzing confusion. Then, differentiation comes into the picture, and uh, you have uh, begin to make distinctions. That object over there is a tree, that is a mountain, that is a valley, that is a lake. This gradually grows up so that out of a chaos, a cosmos is built. That's a process that goes on our, in our lives from the earliest infancy on up. It's a process in which there's developed judgment, um, discernment, discrimination, reason, and memory. And in that, we finally get the cosmos where things are organized and, put in, and we differentiate between them. Now, the very first element in that process is the making of a distinction. Not, not now an indeterminate blooming, buzzing confusion. But you make distinction. Part of that blooming, buzzing confusion is something heard. Part of it is something seen, something felt, and so on. And yes. So that is what um, Mr. Brown is attempting to do, mm -hmm. to deal with the most elemental thing. You're not dealing with the mathematics of number, you're dealing with the mathematics of the most elemental distinction. He has an interesting uh, aspect about him, too, in that he uh, writes under the name of James Keyes as well. James Keyes? Uh, uh, G. Spencer Brown wrote another book named, uh, under the name of James Keyes called Only Two Can Play the... Oh, yes, I know. That's the other side of him. That's, well, that's the other side where the feminine element comes into the picture. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you know that Lewis Carroll had that two sides? I, you... have, uh, I have understood that to be true. Well, his real name was Hodgson, and he was a mathematician. And uh, he had his moments of a sense of play, and I understand it was a little girl that was re related to him, and he told her these stories. And you got Alice at Wonderland and looking through the uh, looking glass out of it. It said that Queen Victoria was very much delighted by this, and she uh, asked him, wrote to him and asked him if he had published anything else. And he sent her a two-volume work on the conic sections. <laughs> Those sides as well. Hmm? You, you have those sides as well. At one point, you are extremely um, involved in extremely technical material, and on the other hand, you have a great sense of humor and a touch with the natural elements and an ability to handle yourself and other things in this material world. <laughs> you have the. Uh, I managed to survive for 93 years. Yes, a very balanced existence you, you carried out. If someone was to ask you a question to get the most, the, the biggest quantity of your essential being at one time, what would that question be? My gosh. <laughs> <clears throat> I might have to think quite a while. <laughs> well, you can. You have a little time. <laughs> My keynote, as it were. 
as it is, in fact. to drive toward the root that awakened in this life. By the root, I mean that from which all comes. Which in Indian philosophy in the Vedantic form is Brahm, but that's just a name. terms the void the void to relative consciousness not a void to ultimate consciousness that's probably the most central driving principle tendency to seek the root with the exclusion of everything else. Mm. With exclusion of other things, other... That from which all comes. It doesn't exclude anything. No, I mean, you, your desire to seek that while excluding other parts of life, say, oh, yes. other just Penetrate, penetrate through by analysis, in my case, which is the chakra pattern, which, which fits me. From uh, appealing down, as it were, to that most element, which is that, which is neither an object before consciousness, nor a subject to consciousness. And my name for it is consciousness, without an object and without a subject. So the ultimate principle is consciousness, but not what we call relative consciousness, but a primary consciousness. So in the ultimate sense, I do reject the conception of the unconscious, except in the relative sense that relative to one state of consciousness, another state may be unconscious, but not from its own point of view. Though there is a difference between me and Dr. Young there. Yes, you've expressed that in, in several ways. However, I must say you've expressed it very affectionately. Oh, I get a lot from him. That was something uh, that was evident to me when you were presenting your position, that it was from a position of knowledge and admiration for his work that you were expressing. Oh, yes. Yes, no doubt about his genius in his field. But how could he be that stupid in mathematics? <laughs> Incredibly stupid. No. Um, it suggests that only a genius can be utterly stupid yes. <laughs> when he's out of his field. I've heard that actually before. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have also noticed that there's a lot of stars. There are stars around your house, and little star design patterns. They're in the stove. I see you have them around here. Is that? What um, about? I don't know. You see the five-pointed star? that you use for an ashtray? Well, that just happens to be so. It was given to me and someone who was in a smelter room of Phelps Dodge. So put the, dip the design into it, and into the molten copper, and it comes out that way. I wondered if there was any symbolic... Well, not, not special. You know, yeah. I haven't oriented particularly to fiveness, but it does have a symbolism. 
Our ashram up there is a balanced cross. The thing... Similar to the... Yes. Yes. The principle of equilibrium is implied in it. And it's not the cross of sacrifice, which is the Latin cross, which has been played such a large part in the history of Christianity. No, we emphasize the principle of equilibrium. Do you have an orientation with the ashram where the, the um, legs of the cross are pointed to any specific... Yes, yeah, they're supposed to be north, south, east, and west. If you... This house is oriented with considerable precision north, south, east, and west because it was done with surveyor's instruments. So it's probably within section, seconds of being true. And how is the, this the room? Is there a significance to the placement of this room? Convenience. <laughs> My wife drew up the plan. It worked out nicely, though. I get a nice view out there. <laughs> um, there's a, a question relative to students coming to you and asking you points of um, specific things for them to do. Have you at all said, well, so-and-so, you ought to uh, no, I don't wash do. your feet a lot, or you no, ought to I don't. live in a cave, or you should, yeah. No, I don't attempt to do that. It depends on the individual. I find if a person is intelligent, I can deal with them. But sometimes they just come and sit. It's difficult to know how to deal with it. <laughs> they just want to absorb the activity. <laughs> uh, and sometimes weirdos come. As one, <laughs> this, <laughs> fortunately, there are not many. He came from southern Oregon. I was, uh, I think, in a wooded area, area in a cabin. And he said that the yetis came around at dusk. Now, these yetis are these myth more or less mythological figures. They're supposed to be about 10 feet high in human shape and have 16-inch length footprints. Uh, he said he saw them about dusk, he left food out on a table, and one of them came and took the food and nodded his thanks for it. One day he went back in, into his cabin, there was Don Juan sitting on a chair with a girl, a young girl on his knee. <laughs> That's good stories. Yeah. Well, that's a bit on the weirdo side. I don't have many of them done. <laughs> well... Is it Don Juan and the girl disappeared later? Did you... I don't know. Uh, this may be a seeing on another plane, which is confused with this plane. And I suspect the stories about uh, the Yeti may be of that sort, because even the Indians seem to... Uh, have accounts of them. And yet our scientists have not been able to verify their existence as physical entities. So it is conceivable that some with uh, what is called second sight have seen entities on another plane. That's the only idea, uh, thought that I have that may be uh, possibly true but no evidence that it is a physical existence. I don't think that our scientists could have missed anything that big. <laughs> Such a good time last year when we were doing this. We just sat here and talked. And this year, this has been just a joyful time for me to sit mm. and talk with you about this. And, uh, yes, okay. Um, you have lived a very disciplined life. In other words, I see that you have studied for long periods of time and you have gone through austerities, being out in the, the uh, fairly severe landscape and um, yes. you've kept yourself isolated in a sort of monastic existence in mm, some, some 
Yes, in some ways I have been rather monastic at times. Have you followed the suggestions of Shankara right down to, um, uh, for instance, uh, celibacy and uh, abstinence and uh, in various ways? Have you ever fasted? Those kinds of things? Oh, fasting, no. It's generally continent life. Uh, artificial fasting. Haven't found that necessary. I think that it depends upon how strong your attachment is to the mundane. If it isn't strong, then you don't need to bother with that sort of thing. And you have always, uh, for long periods of time, you have had female companionship, and we were talking about that completing your, or assisting yes. your anima. Well, they, uh, the evidence is that way. I have had a married experience of 58 years. Sharif for 39 until she died. And after that, Gertrude for 19. And it was a very valuable life, successful in both cases. And is much more balanced and effective in the work than a strictly monastic kind of life. We were co-workers in the work, preeminently in the case of Sharif and myself. It was our work. We came together for the work. And uh, the same with Gertrude. She was supportive. I was in full charge then. But she was very effectively supportive. There were two very successful marriages, and I miss the marriage. You have, um, and now Shankara does not suggest that people be balanced in that way, is that not true? He was an ascetic from the beginning to the end. But there are married gurus in India. But, and when, it is said that when one householder came to Buddha and sa asked if it was necessary to become a monk, Buddha said, no. Some have a temperament for which the rich makes the monastic discipline necessary, but it is not a universal principle, and the householder can win as well as the monk. So it would, logically speaking, then, it would be the person who was distracted by, um, uh, say, the... Yes, the, the temptations of the samsara, then he, then he may the need the monastic or the, or the discipline of the uh, uh, hermitage. But I'd say, well, now, I've heard recently of a monastic individual who was going on such a severe course that he had a vow never to see a woman in his life. Mm. And he went up to the British Jubilee and they had to make special arrangements in the airplane so he would see no woman. Now I say a man that has to do that is pretty weak. <laughs> pretty extreme. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> weak. It, uh, that he can't deal with the feminine without being diverted. And why should the feminine be left out in the search for the other consciousness? So you see the possibility for the feminine as equal? They are, uh, they are equal, or rather the better term is one given by Havelock Ellis, who was one of the great one of our greatest students of sex psychology wrote about a five-volume work on it. Excuse me. And that the relationship is one of equivalence, not of equality. And I would uh, define that this way. In mathematics, we have the concept of the modulus. Um, that's where you consider the quantitative aspect of a numerical entity 
and not its sense. Thus, the modulus of plus 5 is 5, and the modulus of minus 5 is 5. I'd say that the sexes are of equal moduli, but different in sense, you see. So it's equivalence, not equality. And, uh, and that means uh, uh, the, the, when I say not equality, there's no suggestion of inferiority, you see. But that, rather, it's equivalence. And I think that handles the problem. I think it's a mistake for the feminine to try to act like a man. And <clears throat> that she brings something that is of just equal value to what the male brings. But it is in the field predominantly of feeling, where the male is more developed in thinking, and the two are necessary. Now, when you were mentioning you think that society is going over to the matriarchal hmm? hierarchy, you were saying yesterday that, the, that society is going over to the matriarch. Oh, the signs point that way pretty strongly. One thing I notice in television, the young women that are very dynamic and even aggressive, and a kind of uh, softish young man corresponding to them, it, it seems to be growing there. And, well, I was born in the late uh, Victorian period. Uh, the changes are phenomenal. My mother would be horribly shocked if she could be aware of the present time. Um, I can look back and, and see what now happens. A shift from skirts to, to overalls as we used to came, came Dirty overalls even. I don't think that's an improvement. Well, um, I know that you have had a great respect for one lady who was very forceful in her life, H.P. Blavatsky. Oh, yes. And she had a very um, dynamic personality and right. determination. I would say that not that she was tending toward the masculine attributes, but more that she was an individual and character. Well. She was uh, physiologically a pseudo hermaphrodite. Um, uh, you might say she was as much masculine as feminine, than psychologically speaking. What do you say about people in that category? Well, that's a very rare uh, combination. It's really premature. We're not in a time when a true hermaphrodite is possible. But <clears throat> it's a kind. It happened in her case. She was a very dynamic individual, and she was the agent of the brothers, spelt with a capital B, known as Mahatmas, as adepts, and so on. And they exist. And that as agents, he represented them. It is said that one-seventh of each principle, of the seven principles, was retained in the custody of the lodge so she would not make any serious blunder or error, which left her somewhat psychologically crippled. How did this come out? How, did, how, did, how was it seen that she was psychologically crippled in this country? Well, there were elements about her that were erratic, difficult to understand, difficult person to under, personality to deal with. No doubt about that. Um, yet loyalty to the, to the higher authority was absolute with her. Um, 
that uh, behavior at times was erratic, and she is, deserves simply sympathy because it's difficult to live as a psychological cripple. But she accepted it, it in her devotion to the service of humanity. Incidentally, W.Q. Judge, this one up here, has said that she was also to be the agent the last quarter of this century. It was pronounced long ago that the brothers of the East would not come to the West except in the last quarter of each century until the Blessed One himself takes incarnation in a Western body. That they have instead sent agents during the last quarter of its century for some time, I don't know when that began, but certain ones have been identified as such agents. Jacob Bamey, um, oh, other name, recent memory problem. A figure that has a Scandinavian name. You may think of it. Quite a big one. Swinburne. Hmm? Swinburne. Who? Swedenborg. Swedenborg. Swedenborg, yeah, right. Yeah. He's also listed in um, um, the cosmic consciousness among the cases that are given there. He's also referred to by Bodhi, Moody in his life after life. Um, and HPB. And it is said that the one who was the agent of the last quarter of the last century is also the agent of the last quarter of this century in another body. And you have verified this? I have verified it. Now how will one get in into the sphere of this agent? Get into the sphere? Yeah, get into the um, area uh, to experience this particular agent. As there were groups in yes. um, oh, Halcyon group, wasn't that a group of that sort? And, right. Um, you know about them. Mm -hmm. And the, the various societies that have... There are places where you can be found. You're also where you can get in the sphere right here. And at the time of this is the this we are now in the last quarter yes. of the century. Yes. So the evidence will become more apparent as the as the century draws. I suspect so. And we know not when the blessed one will take that incarnation in the Western body. Now is it possible in, in the same way that the Gautama was the Buddha, became the Buddha, and um, uh, Shankara became more of a prominent figure, and uh, Jesus... He Christ. seems to have been committed from birth. Oh, they were birthed. Yes. As are the Tolkus. Mm -hmm. As are the Tolkus. They're committed from birth. Yes, I would say so. Mm -hmm. The... Um, Yes. But there is a moment where they take on the divine being, whereas up till that point they have a semi-regular life. And then at some point there is a turnover. Do you know the story of Shankara? Yes. You know, as he returned to his mother, having learned all the pundits could teach him at the age of seven. And he had to call to the guru at seven years of age. 
I was going to ask you about that, how these things happen at such an early age. That's very special. He was at the Tulku at that age. The intermediate principle of the Buddha, it is said. And that's what I was talking about yesterday yes. through those four tapes. Mm -hmm. Emphasis on the intermediate principle. Mm -hmm. Now, um, there, there, that shows up in uh, people, uh, uh, for instance, Mozart show, it, it showed an extraordinary uh, sensitivity in another area at an extremely early age. Would you say... That does happen. Wiener, too. Mm -hmm. He was a prodigy, but his first volume of his autobiography is ex prodigy. He'd become in, in balance ultimately in a normal human being because feeling does not seem to uh, go through a different pattern of, of extraordinary development. It seems to be normal. And uh, that brings up a kind of dis, uh, disharmony. Here's a child and a level of feeling, and may, um, an adult on the level of thought. And there's a real dissonance there. I saw it in Wiener. It rubbed me people the wrong way. Here was a kid, and here was an intellectual. Later, the balance came about. So... Uh, How does that happen? Well, just growth. Mature, just natural. Right. How, how can, how is it that such a very young body contains such a vast amount of knowledge? Well, how is it in principle possible, you're saying? Huh. No, that's, I think, something we have to go into. Good. Yeah, sometime. <laughs> but it does happen. I've been thinking this is a subject that has attracted my attention for a long time. What, how these developmental time spans occur inside. It's evident that there are prodigies and there are exceptional people. Oh, yes, there's no, no question the prodigies are. Uh, Newton was one. <laughs> he had accomplished his essential work while he's still in the 20s. His interest thereafter centered on religion. And he lived to an old age. And that's a balance as well. Yes, it was a balance. Now, when we look at people like that, um, there are several ways that it can be assumed to have occurred. Some people work with reincarnation. And Rajneesh is a current figure. The reincarnation, of course, I assume, like I assume the law of gravity. <laughs> <laughs> and karma. You, you must realize not everyone assumes that. I know. But I know of no way that you can get a rational interpretation of this universe without the two conceptions of karma and reincarnation. Well, how do you think that occurs? For instance, there is a, um, a discarding of the material body at a certain point. And then, how does that essential quality make the transference to the next material body? Where, what is the... Well... A lot of ideas. We have the Tibetan Book of the Dead. We have yes. Um, a lot of uh, the Mahatma let us tell us something about it. And the Tibetan Book of the Dead a little, and there's other material in the scripture, in the text uh, literature, not scripture. Um, you want me to go through the pattern? Yes, please. Well. First of all, that assume that the empiric human being is a compound of seven principles, that the central core of that is called the Atman, 
which is ultimately a manifestation or form of the Brahman, the root from which all comes. You may use other terms for this. You're not compelled to use the Indian terms. But then there are certain principles of function. One called Buddhi, a spiritual soul. The principle, enrobement as a, a subtlest principle of form. And Manas as the principle of mind in its higher sense. The thing I was talking about in the four tapes. That means an upper triad that persists in spite of death. Then we have a group of four principles tied to the upper three by an antaskarana, or connecting link. There is the lower principle of mind, often called desire mind, or by Aurobindo sense mind, as something we have in common with the animals. As Kama Rupa, principle of form, determined by desire, desire being a force that molds our life a good deal out here. And you have the principle of life itself, called prana, and a vehicle of life called the linga sharira, and popularly the astral body, which also is the paradigm of the gross physical body, which is draped upon it. Now, when death comes, the outermost portion of the physical body falls. It is said that after the heart stops beating and the breath stops, the entity is still in the brain, assimilating to itself the record of that life. During that period, the body should be left very quiet, should not be disturbed. How long is that period? A sufficient period, it seems to be about 24 hours. And so nothing should interfere? Nothing it should be. There should be a very peaceful sitting, setting. It shouldn't be disturbed. It shouldn't be handled by the um, mortician. No cremation situation? Not during that time. I've arranged for that with regret to Ger Sharifa and Gertrude, and I've also left instructions for myself down here, both to the doctor and the mortician. And they have it written out. So there it is, 24 hours of peace. 24 hours of peace. We did play, in the case of Gertrude, the Parsifal, a partner, and had lights all night, candle burning, and a hushed atmosphere. Then, I favor cremation. For that organism, either decay or reduction to ashes. I think the reduction to ashes is better and cleaner way beyond there are the other vehicles. And we're beginning to get some data from our own research now, as in Moody's Life After Life, in the case of some individuals who have had a, a failure of the heart for a brief time, and they brought them back, which tend to confirm the Tibetan Book of the Dead, remarkably, that well, they say 11 days, don't they? Mm -hmm. they the, the suggestion in the Book of the Dead, the Tibetan Book of the Dead, is 11 days. Isn't that correct? Um, and you say 24 hours. There's a... Oh, no, well, that's about something else. 
Uh-huh. This is just the connection with the breaking of the connection with the body. Okay. There'd be decay would set up you know, if you de- dealt with a long period of time. You can get by 24 hours. The body should be kept cool. And then there is what is called a pa- re- passing through a channel of death. It's repeat- reported over and over again in Moody's book. It seems to be a dark channel with a light at the end. But sometimes it's reported like a dark ravine in, the, in the, among mountains. Um, there are other symbols used for it. And then there's a meeting of what is called in Moody's book a being of light. In the Tibetan Book of the Dead, it's referred to as the clear light. And in the Tibetan Book of the Dead, the most desired outcome is to fuse with that clear light, which symbolizes quite obviously consciousness. If fusion is accomplished, then the individual is said to become a Buddha. Uh, in the sense of the Dharmakaya, there are three robes of a full Buddha. This is the most fundamental. And he could at that time withdraw from all future incarnation, but could choose voluntarily to accept incarnation. Now the brothers, where do they fit into that, this plan? Well, brothers have gone through this and have chosen either on the level of the Dharmakaya, Sambhogakaya, well that's a death mass of H.P. Vavasque. Right. Before the tape is over, I want you to tell me about that. But please finish. Um, They have been through this. They have chosen to stay with humanity when they could have withdrawn into a state of undying bliss. And they're in disem. They're in a disembodied place. Essentially, they may be in physical embodiment, or they may be in a subtle embodiment surrounding us and dealing with world problems, even though unseen to us. There are, however, some individuals who have a power of channeling, and through such individuals, these brothers may speak, or at least through certain ones where their rapport, rapport is correct. So you're not necessarily out of communication. Have you ever felt yourself to be um, a channel in that way or experienced mm. evidence? Not in the sense of uh, another voice speaking through me, no but in a sense of another current of consciousness. Yes, there was, sw- of- if you watch that last tape, there was a shift in level toward the end. Yes, mm-hmm. and it affected everyone as well, Um Now in your case, you have given instructions for your own container to be dealt with. Yeah. And you have said on many occasions that you are seeking a conscious death. Uh, con- conscious death. Yeah. And that is the, that according to many authorities in this matter, that is the only way to do it without considering it um, essentially a suicide in some ways, or just a cont- I think I know the state that one would have to be in to make a conscious decision because I found myself in that state on the 13th of February, 1979. 
And that is a state of equilibrium or balance between uh, dying and living with a sense that you could choose to go either way legitimately. John Lilly reports that too. Mm -hmm. John Lilly, Dr. John Lilly reports the same. He does, he had that same, yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, my strong impression was that, that in that state, it can, death can be legitimately chosen and is not suicide. Um, but it involved nothing violent whatsoever. It's just leave the body. Now, now you're not without a vehicle. Apparently it is the astral vehicle in the beginning there. And there are individuals, it's not only reported in the literature, but there's a man by the name of Monroe that develops spontaneous the power to, you may know about him, uh, to move in a subtle vehicle. And so we're beginning to get a knowledge of it, not only from oriental sources, but some from our own sources here, which makes it a little more believable. <laughs> so uh, uh, that is probably the vehicle by which one goes through the first stage of the death process. Literature says you arrive at a place known as Kama Loka. It's an intermediate stage where you linger from a few minutes up to many years. If, for instance, you were had a karmic cycle of 70 years that have been yours that you should have lived out but through an accident or through war something of that kind you're killed at 20 there'd be 50 years that would have to be lived out on this plane and what would that plane look like i don't know not having been there in a form that i brought back some memory of it <laughs> the process very consciously do you think you could remember things like that do you think for the next life you could remember well i have reason to believe it is in principle possible but not very often done they're a very difficult thing to do it's it would really call for an ad up power now do you have have you um for instance, with the man I mentioned, Rajneesh in India, he is building for himself, as did Egyptian pharaohs as well, building sort of an afterlife situation and then uh, setting himself up to move into uh, uh, this plane place, as do some tulkus do that as well. They, they project forth the environment in which they will be living and then tell whoever is looking after them to go there for their next incarnation. Can you see yourself being able to do that? Well, I don't really know because not all of me is here. <laughs> <laughs> there are different possibilities. I think I'd like to stay a while on the other plane. It seems a lot, lot more interesting than this. You, uh, you mentioned that it's been told to you that Gertrude would be there. Oh, yeah. And um, possibly establishments of relationships with mm. people you've been with before. Yes, I've been informed that I can meet her. How do you see those arrangements occurring? Sort of on the past, the way people are in, as you remember them? or as they would be in their most glorified form. There are nice little questions there. Do they look like they looked here? How do you recognize them? Yeah, there's some nice questions. I'll know more about it later. Well, will you let me know? <laughs> if you set appropriate communication. <laughs> How would one go about that from your point of view at this point? <laughs> nice little problem. <laughs> now we need to match up nice little answers. <laughs> we could do it mathematically. There's some way to do it. You want to know about this? Yes, um, this 
mask you told me before was a... It is drawn, it is a copy of the death mask, which I have seen. Could you hold that in front of you? And the artist opened the eyes. They're closed in the death mask. This is, there are only two in the world? That's what I've heard. How did you happen to... It was given you? by one who had authority to Sharifa. Now, there's not very many recorded um, visual pieces of H.P. P. P. Blavatsky. Is there any significance to that? Is there any reason why she is ha so mysterious? Well, what do you mean by recording? She wrote an awful lot. Well, I mean, in terms of um, photographs, there are very few. And, um, and they do exist, though, in the stories of her life. Yes, she was photographed. Of course, my photography was not as well developed back then. As then. She was not opposed to them. N not so far as I know. Mm -hmm. Here you have an enlarged photograph of her associate, W.Q. Judge. And he spent many years with her. Yes, well... Uh, they weren't always together. They were working in different parts of the world. She in India when he was, he was here in the United States. However, they were closely aligned. Oh, yes. Things. Inner, inner correlation. Oh, yes. And um, in your house, they both have prominent positions. I mean, he is here in your study. Sure. And she is in your entryway. Sure. Okay, I'm definitely oriented to the same line. Here's that I dropped it in. Yes, I maintain that line. Do you experience any connection to either one of them internally in terms of um, hearing from them or sensing a part of them being a part of you or your inspiration uh, or transmission, that sort of thing? I talked to both as recently as last... January. Do they know? Not in the, not in this old oh. incarnation, but in the present one. Do they know each other in this present incarnation? Yes. Well, have they any desire to become more public than they are at this present time, or is it? They're functioning. However, they're very, it's a very secret situation. Not too secret. Not too secret. Well, how would one get a hold of them? <laughs> that depends about how, how deeply interested you are. <laughs> now you're only getting information for a record. You're merely questioning me. I don't know how much in reality you're deeply interested. <laughs> well, everything has its thread to some significance. <laughs> uh, at this point, we're coming to about, we have about 10 minutes or so? Yeah. 10 minutes. I have a desire for you. I know that you, yesterday and the day before, you covered a great body of knowledge, which you called your crowning. Um, achievement in some ways and this document is also going to contain that and now a personal view that was very formalized is there something that you would like to have recorded for all time for you in this container um, that would be coming from um, maybe a longer line than you did over the the um, convention period. For instance, that was very, you covered that territory since June, and you had a message for everyone, you extended your blessings, and now here is an informal opportunity to possibly get into any one of those things in, in a general way, and also you being more directly uh, transmitting. Is there something that you would like to put forth in that way? It's put forth in my works and in my tapes. My books and my tapes. I don't get
get the impression of putting it down to a word or two. It's more complicated than that. But what I have to say has been said in three volumes. Well, there's some minor things in addition and about half a million words on tape. And you accomplished those books approximately 40 years ago? You see, the pathways, the event on which that was based was took place on August 7th, 1936, rather late in the afternoon. I start at the suggestion of one whom I called Senior, who was not on this plane. I started writing it up. That led to pathways. Puts a, the, from 36 of the present is 44 years. And I've said what I have been able to say from that base of that event. And philosophy of consciousness without an object followed that? Surely, surely. And that was finished not too long after that period. Yeah, that is right. I've had the manuscript for quite a long time. So your major body, your major work, was completed. I don't... Uh, yes, the systematic part. Most of these were a single uh, tape lecture when it might be 4,000 words, sometimes several tapes for one subject matter. They could be a series of essays not as systematically as those volumes were well, written as systematically as those volumes are. Um, but there's a larger amount of material in the tapes than in the original volumes. However, certain important points are emphasized again and again from different perspectives. So your work continues through this period of time by giving other. Yeah, different angles, mm -hmm. yes. So that, that is part of your dharma, in other words. Right. To present the material and then make it understandable to a lot of different points Yes, of view. I tried to give it a, as correct formulation as I could. I didn't try to make it popular. I tried to make it correct. <laughs> you see, there's a difference between the two. Which I have heard, and I also applaud in you. You have done that over this convention period consistently. Mm. You have not expressed popular views, but they have been precise. And That's what I aim at. And it takes a certain amount of um, not only intelligence, but in uh, perseverance to actually absorb the material as you put it out as well. So that one does not get these things lightly. And so they tell me. <laughs> <laughs> well, you worked for it as well. <laughs> Would you recommend, if you were to pass your self on to other people, would you recommend this as being a fruitful life and one that is, um, you are satisfied with yourself, you've accomplished what you want in your... Uh, I think essentially in one sense, only in, in another sense it's only started. I may be coming back in another incarnation and pick up where I left off. Hope to do that. And would that be picking up? And by the way, I'll say something further. There's one case known where that same I work was done through two incarnations. Cardinal de Cusa and Copernicus. Something that very dangerous to say at that time because of the power of the church. Mm -hmm. The cardinal had the protection of the church. They didn't understand what he's saying. But that is said to be in two incarnations of the same entity. 
Well, uh, the Dalai Lama comes from... Well, that is a different... That is different stuff. He doesn't... He really doesn't lose... Incarn doesn't cease being incarnating. Incarnated. He shifts over to another body. Instead of going to the intermediate zone. You mean immediately? Yeah, immediately to another body. Mm -hmm. And occupies that body. I could imagine something of a strain connected to that sort of thing. But of course, in the childhood stages of another body, there could very well be a withdrawal so that there is a rest period. Anyway. Yeah, that is... Hmm. No. There is a story in the literature, and I think this is given by H. P. Blavatsky. Seemingly, it happened in Tibet. There was a clergyman that wanted to show the throw, show, show that the idea of the continuing incarnation in the Tashi and Dalai Lamas was a fraud that involved something that was not possible. H.P.B. met this man, and there also appeared a group of lamas with a head lama who set up their accommodation in a certain cave. H.P.B. undertook to convince this clergyman. She met the head lama, showed him a certain talisman she had, which he respected at once and granted her request. And here's what happened, so the account says. In that cave, They had a young infant, too young to have known speech. And there was this clergyman there. And the lamas formed a circle. The head lama went into trance. And then the infant got up on its feet and spoke to the clergyman certain words of wisdom. Mm. Then again, it was a cooing child. It was the head lama who had spoken through the child to the clergyman. He almost fainted. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Um, that um, is an intriguing situation, which uh, I would like to develop further. And we have a about three minutes left. Just a few minutes left. We have to get some technical positions that you would be sitting in and doing some technical things with the tape because our time on the tape is over. Yes. Um, however, I personally would like to get into this further. And in fact, if we had more tape, I would put that on tape as well. Uh, Arne, you want to give Dr. Wilson... Yeah.